Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to EU Green Week, Leveling the Playing Field. My name's Mark Fletcher. I'm the Global Water Leader at Arup and I'm a member of the Advisory Board for WOW and I will be your host for today's debate. It's my honour to welcome you to WOW, that's the Interreg Northwest Europe Research Programme focused on circular use of raw materials from sewage. We'll set the scene for this WOW legal debate with presentations by members of the WOW project team. These include Yapa de Best, professor from Avon's University, who will pitch the WOW project. Koos Wessels, Managing Director of Surtec BV, who will share some examples of raw materials from sewage. And Katrin Beal, who's project manager for WOW and business development manager from Calmira Nareda Gum, she'll provide a call for action. We will then have our debate with experts from Netherlands, the Flanders, UK, and Germany. For information, we're recording this session and we're putting it on YouTube later. We'll also send out a PDF of the presentation and a YouTube link to all participants. Wendy Franken, who's a director from Vlario in Genk and part of the WOW project team, is going to introduce the interactive part of our session using Mentimeter. Wendy. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, before we go further, I would like to say uh, something about the um, yeah, presentation mode because now you see now the uh, voting with Mentimeter, but if you would like to see, you can uh, change the screen view in the uh, middle at the top, you can see view everyone, and if you change it to view who's talking, then you only see uh, the active, uh, sorry, view active cameras, then you only see them. It's uh, more interesting for the debate later, then you do not have that uh, much uh, screens later. So now uh, we go to the Mentimeter, and therefore I have the, the help of my colleague Riet. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. There are some difficulties with the sound. Um, for the voting, we're going to use Mentimeter. Um, you can use the, you can use it on your smartphone or on your computer. Um, you can go to the website menti.com, or you can um, take a picture of the QR code uh, to go to the website. And the most important thing you do when you go there is to put in the code and the code for. This presentation is the 63047632. To see if everyone gets a hold of the application, we will first ask a test question. So the test question is, what is your profession? Normally when you are logged into the Mentimeter, you can see the question on your phone or in your browser, and you can there uh, take the votes. We're closing the vote in 10 seconds, and then I will show the results to see if uh, everyone was able to make a vote. You can see the codes also on top of the screen. The code is 63047632. So the voting is closed now, so we will have a look uh, at the results. Okay, if we see here, uh, 
We don't have any legal specialists uh, on the table, but we have some uh, policy makers, also uh, some producers of raw materials and technology supplies. And half of us here uh, today is our other. So uh, I'm very curious about your um, uh, profession. So if you would like to do it, you can put it in the chat. But it was just a question to test. And now uh, I think we can continue with the presentation. And I will give the floor to Jappe. Uh, just a moment, Jappe. Now you can, uh, I will present it now and you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, well, my name is Jappe de Best. I'm a professor at Avance University of Applied Sciences at the Center of Expertise Biobased Economy. I'm working on uh, biobased resources and energy, and I'm also uh, part of the WOW project where I'm uh, involved in one of the, the pilots which were presented this morning during a webinar, but we also, uh, together with our partners, work on the legal framework, and that will be the main topic of uh, today, the short presentation. So, next slide, please. So to give a very brief introduction about uh, our project, so WOW, the, the goals. Uh, so the aim of the project is to uh, start a transition towards a circular approach in sewage treatments. Um, and for this purpose, we have three main goals. So first of all, we want to show that it is technically possible to recover raw materials from sewage. So there we have three pilots running uh, for that, which were the topic of this morning's webinar. Uh, secondly, we uh, would like to show uh, market parties become acquainted with the potential of raw materials from sewage, and we aim at five different products that we uh, that we produce. So PHA, which is a bioplastic, biodiesel, bio oil, biochar, uh, and acetic acid. And uh, finally, we also would like to create a European framework for the steps that need to be followed from waste to raw material. And that would be the center of my uh, brief introduction. So towards a European framework, I call it. And uh, we have four different actions within our project. We have mapped the current policy landscape. Uh, we have looked at the EU best practices on resource recovery. Uh, we are working on national calls for action, um, mainly focused on policymakers. And we are working on the EU roadmap. And briefly, I will discuss all four of them. So first of all, what we did is we um, made a report about the current policy landscape. It was an inventory of applicable legislation within the EU and also the separate countries that we are targeting within this project. And we looked at the complete value chain so from sewage, our input to the final product and the application of the product. And we did this for the five countries, uh, is it five? No, six even, involved in uh, Northwest Europe. So Belgium, France, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And uh, the main conclusions from this report was that despite uh, excessive EU legislation, there is still significant amount of flexibility for the member states or regions. So that also has different approaches uh, attached to that. And the interpretation of key definitions is left to member states and are often based on a case by case analysis, for instance, the end of waste status. If you would like to know more, it's uh, in a report which can be found on our website. And I'm sure we will post uh, the link to the website in the chat uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, so the th second thing we looked at is uh, the EU best practices of resource recovery. Recovery. So we gave an overview of critical success factors of the recovery of raw materials from sewage and on how to bring these raw materials to the market. And we did this based on lessons learned in different EU subsidy projects. So we had a lot of interviews. And uh, we have uh, two main conclusions, or first of all, we have two important drivers that we distinguish uh, when looking at all the projects. First of all, it was the acceptance of raw materials from sewage, which was an important driver. And also secondly, policies related to the use of products from sewage. And secondly, uh, we distinguish that it is difficult to distinguish generic critical success factors but we also saw that products tend to be more successful if there is uh, regular consultation with regional and national authorities. 
So there's uh, yeah, regular consultation about if you're heading in the right direction and if what you are doing is, uh, is allowed and possible in the end. And also uh, when a project is not afraid to take a next step in legal acceptance of a product if not all signs are green yet. So sometimes you have to dare to take the next step. Next slide, please. And well, based on the uh, the overview of the different policies and also the, the uh, what I just presented, the best practices uh, and a lot of uh, uh, meetings with policymakers, we came up with national calls for action. So we made one for each of the different countries involved in this project. And these national calls for actions give a sketch of the legal context of resource recovery from sewage. We also uh, dis uh, distinguish or mention the mean main legal challenges of making valuable products from sewage and finally we uh, give short and medium term actions to overcome these challenges and uh, on the right side you see an example of what this action plan concept looks like so in this case for the Netherlands um, so as I said legal framework the, the challenges and also uh, the five actions that we uh, determined for the Netherlands um, and we made uh, yeah, six different ones for each country. There's a different action plan. And when you look at the common denominators, you see that uh, uh, what's important is to create a clear substantive assessment framework for raw materials from sewage, which at this moment is often uh, lacking. Uh, secondly, expand the options for agreeing to an end of waste status of the same type of raw materials for different locations and different customers. So you then don't have to apply for an end of waste status for each different product or location that you uh, are working on these materials. And finally, what's very important is the free trading of raw materials between countries. Uh, so for instance, end of waste status applies for all EU countries if you apply for one. Next slide, please. That's oh, that's already where I am. So with the uh, EU roadmap, we are currently working on that, and we hope to finish that before the holiday. Uh, but are there any questions at this moment? Uh, I think I, I don't think there's any questions. I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Okay. I'm, going to I'm going to suggest that at this stage we go forward, and Koos then presents next. So Koos, could you present next, please? Uh, and thanks very much, Yapa. You're yes, uh, thank you for for uh, for the introduction, uh, Mark and, and, and Jappe, for for the presentation. My name is uh, Coase Wessels. I'm managing director of uh, Certec DV. Uh, we are a technology provider recovering uh, or, or providing technology to recover cellulose from sewage, and from that uh, we are, uh, I would say, a producer of technology. And in this presentation, I basically we'll give you an outline of the route that we went for uh, reuse of, uh, of cellulose. Uh, do I share my... Ah, there we are. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> talking about cellulose from sewage, it's not something that I was sitting one day on a toilet and thought, okay, we're going to, to uh, recover this and reuse it. Uh, basically, it came from the idea of making uh, sewage treatment plants more energy uh, efficient. And from that, we started to harvest uh, resources, so uh, suspend, uh, suspended solids, what turned out to be basically toilet paper. Uh, you, you're going to ask the question, maybe, is it worth recycling? Well, the, the content in the Western European countries that ends up in a sewage treatment plant is about 4 billion tons a year of, uh, of cellulose. And there are different applications uh, for, for it if you harvest it. and, and upgraded to a uh, recyclable uh, resource again. Yeah. In the next slide, there are some uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, I would say, advantages of applying this kind of technologies. It has uh, an effect on the downstream processes on the treatment plant, so you save energy there, you have less um, waste materials coming from that, and besides that, you have a uh, a recovered resource that's well reusable so in the total uh, value chain you reduce the co2 footprint of the, the whole value chain partly on the tree on the treatment plant and partly by replacing other uh, other resources starting to do with uh, that then you come with uh, uh, quite some challenges and the first one i would say is, is on the next slide is uh, a kind of chicken and egg situation 
first uh, in the customer and, and, and uh, relation with regards to the water company, but also the buyer of the material. The uh, primary objective for a water authority is to purify sewage and, and preferably at low cost and an environmental friendly way. Uh, and for the customer, uh, basically they are looking for a re reliable uh, supply of materials. Uh, it means that you have to overcome this in a way. On the other hand, there's also, uh, I would say, the end of waste status. If a customer, if I bring material to a customer, uh, you have to have an end of waste status. Uh, you can do it for uh, demonstrable purposes, but to have a, a relationship and to build a market, you need to uh, prove that you can, can uh, make something that is usable for them. And on the other hand, to get an end of waste status, you have to prove that there's a market for it. So you have to overcome these two, I would say, chicken and egg situations. Well, how, how was the road for us on the next slide? We started to do uh, pilot tests, uh, presenting our technology to the water companies. Uh, there was interest and they were prepared to contribute in, in pilot research, getting information about performances, effects from downstream processes and it allowed us also to determine the value of the product that we harvest uh, then to get a, a customer interested in our product uh, in the next we had to produce on a long uh, on on a larger scale also materials so we started to build a i would say a production plan uh, on the same side to produce cellulose from sewage and we found customers interested to uh, investigate these kind of applications. The first ones were in uh, in asphalt as an additive to stabilize uh, this asphalt. And then you, you have a problem. You, then you have a product, and you might think that uh, that we're almost there. But as indicated on the next slide, there is still, I would say, a long way to go. Because uh, sewage is a uh, is considered a waste material, meaning that the products coming from sewage are also considered to be a waste material. And uh, having a company uh, allowed to use this material, they should normally have a permit to process waste. You have some issues with regards to uh, transport. Suddenly, when you go across the border out of the, EU, the European Union. Uh, so, and, and in our case, I would say that cellulose was a tip, having a typical problem because you have to apply for end of waste status on the end product. So when you make something out of it, you know, if you use this cellulose for asphalt, you need to have it on the asphalt. Or if you use it in biocomposites, you, you have to apply for the end of waste status for, uh, for biocomposites. And this means that you have to ask again and again this uh, end of waste status for each product. If you go to uh, to the next uh, slide, yeah, then uh, this is this is quite an intensive uh, route to go through with all these these products. So so finally we found a way and, and we discussed it here in the Netherlands to to apply for an end of waste status uh, in a kind of clustered situation. We said okay all kinds, uh, let's say the construction materials like uh, isolation materials, asphalt, concrete, they have a kind of similar risk, allowing us to reduce the number of, of uh, files that we have to submit, but it are long-term processes. And, and one of the issues is that there is no clear guideline to demonstrate that your product is safe and does not have any risk in itself to our environment or the people that use it. There's always something that you can analyze to prove more. So and it's an ongoing route. Uh, so this to build a, an application for an end of waste status is something that, that uh, is starting to grow by communication. And in our case, it took about four years to come to a, I would say a complete application uh, that was applied for in 2018. But up till now, there's no yet a decision we have some indications, but a decision is not there. And it has to do with other developments around us as well. So when something new comes to the market, it has to do with cellulose. Uh, it's reconsidered whether the regulation that is for us, does it count also for the others? So 
the file is, is still, I would say, under negotiation. Uh, and then there's another thing. If we, we, we would get this end of waste status and I go to another country, it doesn't mean that I get the end of waste status there again. So it might be that we have to go through all these procedures again in the other countries uh, uh, once again and again, taking all this cost with it. So, so what we are are, are looking for uh, is, is is we are aware that that uh, by doing this, changing uh, our economy to into circularities, that we face some some I would say some challenges, but we also see a lot of possibilities, and not just for us, but also for society to to make really some big steps. I also recognize that there is a struggle, and the struggle is is. Uh, not only for policymakers, but also for technology developers, users, and others. And and I think that there is uh, maybe you have the feeling like 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 the guy on 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 ice that you see in the picture that you are are shouting in the area, nobody's listening. But I think that that what we need to find is a way to understand each other and to uh, understand the needs of each other. Uh, but we have to, I would say, speed up because in one way, the environment doesn't allow us to wait too long. We have set some targets already, the first ones on 10 years, and, and, and in, 15, if, uh, in 2050, we want to be completely circular, but it's a challenge. But also our, to, value, to uh, make economic uh, advantage out of our technological advantages, uh, we don't want to take that too long. Uh, my, my, my uh, yeah, call would be not to get uh, additional regulations, but more to, I would say, simplify it. I heard also uh, some ideas about certifying, but I think that this just will uh, take another uh, administrative procedure where we have to go to, and we have to find a way how to deal with resources from sewage in a safe way for the environment and for people, because I think this is, is really uh, one of the most important things. Another thing that that should be uh, that's for us at, at least really important is that we should allow cross-border use of recovered materials. Uh, there is a significant amount of cellulose in sewage, but to make it to do it on an economical way and to really have an impact, we should do that not just in one country by country, but we should do that Europe-wide and maybe also out of that still. This is, uh, I would say, the, the part where I would like to finalize my my uh, presentation. Uh, we we have to change our thinking. Uh, uh, I sometimes refer to a quote from Albert Einstein: "We cannot solve our problems with uh, the same thinking that we used when creating them." Uh, I think that right now everybody understands that we have to act differently, but we have to do it in in the whole way and not just technological and not just by policy, but it should be an integrated solution of all involved in the uh, in the value chain. So thank you so far. And if you have questions, feel free to ask or contact me after this, uh, this session. Thanks, Koos. That was really, really helpful, um, uh, really clear. Uh, this call for simplification to keep everything safe, I think is really important. Um, Katrin, you're now going to present and uh, continue along the same vein. Thank you. Katrin. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm uh, Katrin Bell. I'm working for the Regional Water Authority Vallei & Veluwe in the Netherlands. And I'm also the project manager uh, of the WOW project. Um, but I'm also talking uh, on behalf of the raw material producers perspective. Um, because I'm working for a water authority. Um, and I do also face some challenges. If I do want my colleagues to become just as enthusiastic as I am for um, reusing raw materials from, uh, from sewage. Um, because as you heard uh, from Koos and Jappe, um, in the current situation, it takes a lot of time and uh, courage to uh, work in this field. Um, we heard that the current uh, EU legal framework leaves some room for interpretation. And this results in different national end of waste procedures. Um, 
also from our best practices study we did in the WOW project, we had interviews with more than 32 different EU projects. And uh, we all came to the same conclusion uh, that we face challenges at this moment if we want to bring our uh, valuable products to the market. Uh, so we are not alone. We are definitely not alone in this challenge. And therefore, I'm raising a call for action. We believe that policy harmonization on national levels is needed to create an EU level playing field in which we can uh, easily, quite easily and freely tr uh, trade our products across Europe. And this is really needed to make the market uh, become acquainted and enthusiastic about our products from sewage. So let's go to the debate and ask our panel members how can we reach a uniform legal framework for the circular use of raw materials from sewage? I'm very curious about the debate and uh, I give the floor to you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Katrin. And that's a, that's a great segue into the debate. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce our panel members so that you know who you're talking to. Our panel members are as follows. From the UK, we've got Dr. Heather Smith. Heather's a senior lecturer in the School of Water, Energy and, and, and Environment at Cranfield. She's heavily involved with the policy and social aspects of the circular economy, including one of our sister research projects under Horizon 2020 funding, NextGen. From Luxembourg, we've got Robert Schmidt. He's director of the Luxembourg Environment Agency. From Germany, we've got Frau Dr. Eva Harlatz. Ava is a legal advisor at the Green Economy Network, North Rhine-Westphalia, and she's a project leader at INZIN, the Institute for the Future of Industrial Society. From uh, Belgium, we've got Dirk Hallett, he's strategic co coordinator at the Flanders Knowledge Centre for Water, uh, Vlakwa, I think. And then for the Netherlands, we have Dieter Staat, he's responsible for EU affairs for the Dutch Water Authorities. Uh, I'll ask a series of questions to our speakers to get a <laughs> perspectives. I'll ask all our speakers just to keep your answers quite concise. And after each question, um, Wendy's going to help in terms of gaining public opinion through Mentimeter, so we'll have that opportunity to have some interactions. So first of all, the big dream what opportunities are offered when there's one clear legal framework? And I'll ask this question to each panel member, maybe just one point each. Dirk, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, sir? Um, uh, what, maybe one clear point about this big dream. Well, it's uh, when you recover substances from sewage, you're actually going to create a secondary market within a primary existing market, which is already very well established, which has this access to its raw materials, distribution channels, uh, clear product uh, categorization. So if you really want to speed up and have impact in an existing primary market, it's very important to have a, a uniform legal framework. This is a key message I would like to share. That's great, thank you, Dirk. And maybe Robert, a German perspective. Um, so it's uh, the Luxembourg perspective. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I think it's quite quite important, as it was said, that uh, we have uh, a unique uh, framework to, to boost uh, this, uh, the market of the secondary raw materials. Uh, the problem that we have is that uh, finally we have a, a, a European framework, which is uh, the waste framework, and um, fi finally we, we have uh, we have a, a, some uh, uh, additional. Uh, Tax uh, or decisions, uh, for instance, for scrap, which is the European right uh, applicable. So uh, this is a quite um, f finally it's quite a good thing, and uh, scrap it, it can be used uh, everywhere in, for, in the same conditions in in, in Europe. So uh, I believe that that's uh, quite uh, if we have uh, not this case by case. Uh, uh, 
decisions, but a more general uh, framework. Uh, this can uh, help us, this can help uh, the producers, but it also can help uh, decision makers and also administrations uh, because it's uh, quite, quite easier to understand. But the general uh, perspective and the general approach has to be uh, defined. Thanks, Robert. That's very good, very helpful. And maybe Dieter, maybe you've got a perspective. Yeah, thanks for this great question. Uh, first of all, uh, I represent the Dutch water authorities and the Dutch drinking water companies in Brussels. Uh, so I'm uh, working on this clear legal framework. Um, today, I will mainly focus on uh, the experiences of the water authorities, so-called water boards in the Netherlands. Um, the I would really like to focus on the opportunities of such uh, 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 clear legal flame framework because uh, several of the previous speakers already uh, mentioned some examples of the really interesting raw, secondary raw materials that can be recovered in the wastewater treatment process. Uh, and um, But without a clear framework, uh, it will not be the right, uh, it will not be possible to do so. So, uh, yeah, my, my, my dream would be that there is no legal barriers anymore and that we will have a legal framework that incentivizes and supports the recovery of raw materials and at the same time creates the right market conditions that are needed to for a good business case. Thanks very much, Steve. So that's re really helpful and we're building some momentum, I think. Uh, Heather, maybe a UK perspective? Sure, thanks. Yeah, and um, and thanks for the initial presentations. Uh, it was really interesting stuff. I think the big opportunity um, here from from having a clear legal framework um, is is really around shifting a mindset uh, so that uh, the emphasis is on um, the resources rather than the waste product, uh, and and the use of recovered materials becomes more of a default position. The production and the use of them. Uh, becomes more the default rather than uh, something extraordinary, which it which it currently is, um, and I think that will help sort of solidify again that the the materials can be used as a as a default stance rather than again as uh, become something more mainstream. Well, that's a really really useful perspective. Thank you. So Ava, maybe you'd like to um, give us your your point or your view. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, what the clear legal framework. Uh, how important it is for our uh, circular economy it is the main issue is to build the trust and um, confidence in the circular economy. But the question is always how to build trust and confidence in the circular economy. It is always the main important point that the players, the stakeholders, the industry have to need a trust in the materials and products coming from recycling. It could not be that some products in the other countries of the EU has, have a different parameter than this in the other EU countries. So, as I said, the most important issue is to build trust and the confidence in the circular economy. So, what we need is exactly clear legal framework in this purpose. That's, that's fantastic. And that's a good way to round off our first question, I think. I'm now going to pass over to Wendy, who's going to run a, a little <laughs> Mentimeter again. Wendy? Wendy, are you there? Ah, oh, yes. Yes, it's uh, it, and we're going to the next question for the participants. If you go to menti.com or you are still at menti.com, you can uh, log in with the code 6304-7632 and there you can see the next question. What contribution to the EU circular ambitions could you have offered if there was a clear European framework for raw materials from sewage? We now give some time to uh, answer. I can see that the answers are coming in. Okay. 
It's very impressive the technology, Wendy. I'm, I'm we'll give uh, ten more seconds before the closing results. the votes. Thank you. The vote is closed now. Um, I'm going to show the results, and then we're going back to Mark. Thanks, Wendy. That's, that's really that's really exciting, and it shows that we've got a full range of on the people who are on the call, full range of people responding there. So at the moment, that's tons and tons of. of raw materials from sewage for bio-based products. That's, our, that's scored highest in there. Really helpful. And that's new circular, apologies, my eyesight's going, new circular technologies. You're testing me, you're testing all my senses all at once. Anyway, we're going to go on to our next question now. And, um, and this one, I, maybe I'll just pick a few of you at, at, at random. But what inhibits us? to reach this goal. So we've, we've got this great idea of a, a goal, but what inhibits us? Dieter, maybe you could give us a perspective on that. Yes, thanks a lot. I'm afraid I will echo a bit of the earlier comments, but I think uh, repetition is always good. I believe when I think about this, the first thing that comes to my mind is that there is a lack of achievable and clear EU-wide end of waste criteria in combination with a supporting and incentivizing legal framework. So as we discussed before, uh, the materials recovered from sludge and wastewater uh, still have the label waste from the waste framework directive. And, um, but the same directive also provides us the opportunity to in introduce so-called end of waste criteria. So these criteria you use to determine uh, what conditions, under what conditions the waste uh, or the resources recovered from waste can be reused in a circular economy in a safe way. And I think we, yeah, the lack of that uh, is causing that we don't reach the full potential uh, uh, for the circular economy and especially uh, from the water sector. So because if you want to trade uh, uh, resources recovered from sludge or wastewater uh, over the border, and you don't have EU-wide uh, end of waste criteria, uh, then it will not be possible. So I think this is the first clear uh, answer I could give to you on that. Uh, uh, thanks, teacher. I think that's really helpful. And from our previous discussions about this, how do you change mindsets? I think these are the things that could be real enablers. So that's really good. Uh, maybe Dirk, maybe you could give us, what, what do you think inhibits us to reach this goal? Yeah, maybe I also want to echo on what was previously said on uh, creating more trust and confidence. Then I think it's also very important in the way that we look to innovation. And sometimes I have the impression that people look to innovation and like mana that falls from the sky and is perfectly eatable, while it's actually a, a, a continuous process of learning. A toilet producing factory can look back on millennia, decennia of learning. So the same holds true for uh, creating a new uh, market from uh, uh, sludge or uh, recovering resources. And for this, I think it's very important that we took fold, we invest more in demonstration projects because it's by acting, doing things in practice that we learn. Learning leads to new, new knowledge, knowledge that we can bring back into the action and by this improve into innovation and also the confidence in these type of technologies. And secondly, which is very much linked to that, is not only to focus on single point demonstration projects, but really work on a portfolio of demonstration projects that learn from each other. So that knowledge innovations that are being developed in one demonstration project can be flexibly integrated in other demonstration projects, rather than to have to wait to the end of a demonstration project yeah. to submit a new project before a new insight can be brought in. So for me, this is a, a very important uh, uh, key message that we have to look very differently to innovation. Well, I agree with you, Dirk, and I think that it's quite insightful, really. People get the confidence and we learn from demonstration projects. Really good point, that one. Maybe, maybe Heather, um, maybe what do you think? What do you think inhibits us? I think one of the biggest hindrances here is, is um, simply cost. Uh, and again, so build, building on some of the things that were said previously, 
um, because the the process of of achieving the the required status is is long and complex, and you ha has to be repeated for every product and in every country. The, the cost of that, of doing that, can just be insurmountable for, for a number of actors, and that particular, is particularly the case for smaller stakeholders, you know, SMEs and the like. So, um, so, so the cost of, of undergoing the current regulatory framework uh, can be prohibitive. I, I, I couldn't agree more, actually. And, um, and, um, and we can think about the cost. We aren't really seeing the value in thinking about what's happening in terms of carbon or how we're significantly reusing and reducing that stockpile of waste. Um, Wendy, do we have a Mentimeter on this one or do we do we have the next question and then want to follow the next one? I just want to check you're in charge. No, no, we do not have a question now. Uh, okay. We will have, uh, That's uh, okay. So the next question, what could be the role of national policymakers towards a uniform, clear legal framework? Um, and uh, maybe Robert. Well, I, I, I think I, um, it's uh, quite difficult for each uh, national policymaker to, to uh, intervene and uh, to, um, to, to get a uniform, clear legal framework on European level. So um, I think this, this has something to be uh, done, done by, the, by the Commission. But I think on, and then I would step on what I said, uh, said before. I, I think that on a national level, it is quite important that the policymakers uh, support and um, support uh, projects and uh, initiatives in. Uh, um, in circular economy and uh, for for instance for for, um, for financial support for for, for uh, also for for a mind setting support so uh, I think it's quite quite important that also the people the general population take care and uh, um, be aware of uh, of all these uh, problems and uh, uh, except all also the uh, materials uh, coming from uh, from from, uh, from secondary raw, raw materials, so I, I think it's quite quite an important uh, step for, or an important uh, task for for national policies uh, to do the policies promotion. Thanks, Robert. That, that's really helpful. And I was just as you were talking, then I was just thinking about what Dirk had said about you know demonstration projects, or sometimes. When people just have good examples, they're the sorts of things that give people a bit more confidence. And it's about people getting behind this, I think. Um, maybe Heather, maybe you could just give us a. What, what do you think would be the role of national policymakers in this? Yeah, national policymakers and 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 regulators, um, I think, have have a key role in this. You know, given the complexity of the current European landscape that we've talked about, uh, you know, they they. Can have a, an important role in, in simplifying some of the governance um, at a national level, um, you know, creating that that space uh, to, to try things and the incentives that that, that Robert was mentioning, uh, and that can be that can be simple things to help just normalize the idea of of doing these kinds of projects and and, and adopting more circular systems. Um, even even down to things like uh, encouraging data sharing between the different um, stakeholders that are that are adopting these things, uh, and 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 some of the public engagement um, side of it. So I think there there are a few things. Even even with a sort of complex European landscape, there are there are a number of things that national regulators can do. Thanks, Heather. That's really helpful. And I, I was expecting governance to come up at some point. It's really important that we're clear on that and we keep that as simple as possible. And um, Dieter, maybe you, you could give us a, a, a perspective. Yeah, two points actually. Um, I believe that national policymakers and legislators, when they are looking at the risks of, uh, of recovered materials, they should mainly also look at the application, the future application of these materials, and to make sure that. Um, uh, really the risk assessment is focused on that so that we have the right risk in mind uh, and make sure that there is a of course a proper track and tracing uh, system in place um, and second of all I think the national legislators can really play a role in also um, 
making a plea towards the European level to come up with European action to simplify the framework and to come up with EU-wide uh, criteria once again. So because if the member states are uh, calling upon the Commission, the Commission has an extra incentive to act. Very practical and pragmatic. Some good suggestions there. Thanks, Tito. Wendy, I think it's over to you on the Mentimeter. No, uh, I just would like to go to the chat because uh, we okay. also have questions there. And then afterwards, uh, for the next question, we go uh, to Mentimeter. Okay. It's I'm uh, in your hands. Go on. Okay. Now we have um, I, two questions and one um, link to the report of the critical success factors. You can see it in the chat. And the question from Kozes, what do you see as the low-hanging fruit and what action is uh, easy uh, and, made, uh, and, and could make a difference. Um, of course, if you would like to add something to the question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Or otherwise, I would uh, I like to uh, have this question for uh, for the panel. Okay, Kos. Well, I, I can add something to it. I see sometimes uh, issues that for uh, me are looking to be simple to overcome, but they uh, are more complex than I, <laughs> that, uh, from my perspective, because I don't think that we all speak the same language and understand each other right. But maybe from the perspective of the panel, panel members, they see some things that are easy to, or relatively easy to change, and that really could make a difference hearing these kind of stories. Yes, anybody who would like to comment on that? No. Okay, and then we also have a question from Jappe. How can we help policymakers from uh, our perspective of the World Project? So, uh, looking to uh, I, to you as panel member, do you have some uh, points that we can uh, take with us in our uh, panel? I, I wanted to ask. Okay. Can I can I can I comment on that? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask what will happen with the recommendations of the project, because from what I've understood is that um, what often happens with European projects that we have great results, but then uh, the, they will not find their way into legislation. Um, will, will there be a discussion with the European Commission on, uh, on the findings of the project? Because uh, I, I believe from what I saw is there, there are some clear recommendations, especially for the European Commission. That is absolutely uh, the goal that we will discuss this uh, with the uh, representatives of the European Commission. So uh, we will take that uh, into account. And Can I, I comment on that as well? Um, yes. Because it, 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 it kind of answers that, but also links to Kusu's previous question. Because in terms of um, how we help the policymakers, I think one of the key aspects there is to find the consultation opportunities that are ongoing that the results from these projects um, uh, will feed into uh, and I know that process is ongoing in terms of feeding into the uh, the revision of the urban wastewater treatment directive for instance and we're in a we're in a stage now with European legislation of uh, of a big cycle of change with the legislation there are lots of opportunities coming up around that so feeding into those processes is key um, and at the national level it's the same you know finding those opportunities uh, to feed into those processes um, of consultation where they're ongoing and we have that opportunity in the UK at the moment through new um, a new water resource planning cycle and, and uh, the start of a new business planning cycle for instance um, and, and, and to answer Kusa's question I mean effectively that's the low-hanging fruit <laughs> is, is you know what's what's the kind of easiest things to gra grasp is, is the you know where those opportunities exist to really seize on them and say, okay, what can we do to change this? Maybe we're not solving the whole thing, but maybe we, there's there's a small adjustment that can be made within that consultation process where we can help shift the process forward. Okay, uh, thanks. I think Dirk's hands up. Dirk, have you got something to add there? Yeah, just a general remark is that uh, policy makers follow society. So, um, Maybe you also have to think how you can uh, engage society in this uh, in this issue next. And you see now more and more citizen science projects are getting uh, society engaged. So maybe this is also a, a way to help policymakers because they look to what lives in society. It's not the opposite uh, the opposite way around. 
So I think the whole recycle, reuse, repurpose, rethink, that whole circularity is picking up on all of that movement. I think it, sometimes it's just, just seeing it, it all in the same sort of framework of understanding rather than the separate initiatives in different places. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Wendy, should we move on to the next question? Yes, my proposal is we go now to Mentimeter. Okay. So uh, I think I think this is um, a question to the panel members individually and to the members of the group. Yes, and this is the last interest. question we have for you using the Mentimeter. I yeah. believe that Europe will be circular in. This is already the case. 2030, 2050, or even my grandchildren's grandchildren are not going to experience that. Okay, we will leave this question uh, because it's also the same question for the panel members and we will give the results of uh, all of you uh, after we discuss this with the panel. Mark, back to you. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of you individually to pitch in. So, um, so first of all, maybe Dirk, what do you think on that range of now, 2030, 2050, or not even my grandchildren? What do you think? I found it a hard question, but I've put 2050 because uh, when looking to the to the energy landscape, we made uh, millennia ago we made a switch from uh, to uh, fossil fuels, but we're still burning wood. But I believe that by 2050, the circular economy will be the default option. Okay. The dominant Ava, what do you think? I am fully agree with Dirk, and 2030. Will be 2030 even earlier. I am suppose will be much more better, but I'm, to be realistic, I am 2050. Um, since we now uh, can see what has happened, for example, in Germany, nobody in Germany was thinking for 20 years ago that we will have this change in Germany in all um, atomic uh, plants producing yes. energy. So it's now it's uh, realistic. So I'm sure that we will reach these goals on 2050, but to be very optimistic, I suppose even 2030, so in even 10 years. Okay, so Dieter, what do you think? It's interesting listening to the rationale. <laughs> yeah, no, I would like to be optimistic, but uh, the Dutch water authorities altogether, they agreed upon a goal of 2050 to be uh, uh, circular, fully circular as water authorities. So, um, yeah, I prefer earlier, but I, I would say 2050 is a nice point on the horizon. This is why we need companies like Cooses out there doing things, getting things out there to start to get this confidence in these demonstrators. And what about you, Robert? What do you think? Well, um, I think I'm the same opinion as all my previous co colleagues. That's why I also believe that it is in 20, 2050. Um, when, when I think back, we, we started uh, support collection and uh, discussing recycling uh, in the early 90s. And um, all over Europe, we are not yet uh, at, a, at a good level in uh, support collection. So this is 20, 30 years ago. So I, I believe that we also need uh, 30 years uh, for uh, to have uh, a good circularity. Okay. And Heather, are you going? To, are you going to go along with the rest of the flock, or are you going to step out there bold and? Yeah, no, I, I, well, I, but maybe not in the way you're thinking. Uh, I, I'm perhaps yes. more cynical than than some because I, I see this question as a bit like. It's a bit like asking, when will Europe be sustainable? Uh, I'm not sure there ever is a point where we could say definitively, OK, yes, now we're sustainable. I think it's a little bit like that with circularity, I think. I, I, don't, I don't know that we'll ever actually get there, to be fair. However, I do think that we will see a lot of progress in the next 10 to 10 to 30 years, basically. Uh, I think that the period we're in now with the, with the kinds of policy fluctuations that we're seeing and some a lot of parallel initiatives like the climate change agenda and, and the push towards energy neutrality and carbon neutrality in the water sector. 
I think that will drive a lot of change towards circularity. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe I'm a bit cynical about whether we will completely get there. It sort of took, it took to his back on what Coos has said about that low hanging fruit. We'll take the value off some of it, but yeah, I get that. So Wendy, I'm going to use Chairman's prerogative and ask you, Wendy, when would you, when do you think across those four options? Um, I hope that it will be in uh, 2030, <laughs> but uh, and therefore we are uh, working on it very hard in uh, in our project. So um, I'm quite optimistic. So um, we will go. I I would so, like to go for 2030. So we need that enthusiasm to go for 2030. But I think it, I would say that it looks like 2050 is probably the the general view across the panel. Um, let's see what can we see what the scores the scores on the doors are, please. Oh. <laughs> well, I think that probably reflects the discussion we've had. A little bit of optimism, uh, a little bit of uh, never say never, but it might be a while. So that, I think that was really really helpful. Great. So can we move on to our next question, please? And that is. What's the first step we take tomorrow? Okay, what do you think the first step is that we should take tomorrow? Um, how about Robert? What do you think that first step should be? Well, I, I think that it's quite quite important to to um, to show that that uh, there are already products and that uh, uh, which are circular and uh, that all these uh, these products. Uh, um uh, something like uh, li like labeled uh, to to show really that that they are circular because uh, today we have a, a lot of uh, products on the market uh, called uh, circular but uh, finally it's a quite a question of uh, of clean washing so i think we we need a uh, reliable um, certification of of these products with a clear uh, procedure how how to uh, to to demonstrate that these products are really designed in a circular way, and all of this, I think that I'm convinced that this is a major part of getting confidence to to the population for 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 all these products and also for for this change of of mindset. We've seen how that's come in with food. We've seen how it's come in even with something like a fridge. So I, I get where you're thinking. And if people, if we can convert people into seeing circular in the right way, labelling the certification could be, I'm, I'm sure we, we might have some discussion about that one. Ava, what do you think? I think we need not only one step. We need uh, several steps and in exactly the same uh, time which need to be done. The first of all, we need a switch, a switch in our head to treat a secondary raw materials as exactly in the same, um, uh, same uh, level as the primary raw materials and do in this normalization. So we have to try um, to treat the secondary raw material as the primary raw materials and of course we need the funding which be available to the industry which we applica applicate such uh, secondary raw material. We need support these companies which use the secondary raw materials. So um, not only in this case we are as a European much more sustainable and um, the steps um, I suppose had to be done yesterday, not tomorrow. Yeah, so funding to prime the market, a bit, a bit like we use water to prime a pump. So, yeah, I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, Dieter, what do you think? Yeah, of course we need the mind shift, but the mind shift in society and politics is already going. Yeah, uh, we have a new circular economy action plan, for example. But uh, this is a vision on how to go towards this uh, circular economy. But what is missing, or what is, in my view, not enough, um, that it is translated into legislation and into new legislation. So that with every uh, legislative view, review, the circular economy will be uh, included. So, um, yeah, in the, I, I just mentioned the circular economy action plan already. 
uh, in the circular economy action plan the commission for example announced that they will um, look into the possibility to develop end of waste criteria the thing where i talked about before our first key key waste streams and from the water sector's perspective of course we really hope that they will also look to the water sector and to water and sludge um, so that's that's a big hope and i really hope that this will happen uh, preferably tomorrow um, another another legislative act that has already been mentioned is the urban wastewater treatment directive which is under revision at the moment there the european commission is trying to include uh, the circular economy aspect but until now the only thing i have seen what the commission is thinking about is to um, introduce a recovery uh, obligation for phosphorus on big wastewater treatment plants but there again uh, water operators can recover the phosphorus but if there is no market then yeah then we can recover it but then it doesn't make any sense and, and there again we need the end of waste criteria because you can recover it and if you cannot transfer it over the border yeah then we cannot make an economy of scale and then we cannot create a business case so uh, i really what i would like is to see uh even more prioritization of circular economy in eu legislative processes so I think that's really helpful and i think i think that phosphorus that little example it, it brings it to life a little bit really you can go so you can recover all of those things but that prime in the it brings in what eva was saying i think about prime in the market is really important I can't help thinking that once you sort of get these things going, they all start working together, and that's really what we want to do, get out of the blocks. But Bernard, have you got a, what, what do you think might be the first steps from your perspective? Well, for me, what's uh, important is that we come to a different um, assessment uh, framework for uh, to come to a fair comparison between different practices. And what you see today is that you have a new uh, innovation or technology concept, and then it's compared with with the business as usual scenario and the conclusion is the innovative approach is not competitive but actually that is not a fair comparison because these two approaches find themselves in a different uh, timing of upscaling the, the the business as usual scenario had already years and years of experience uh, adoption to become to the situation where it's now so i think that's a very important first step is how can we come to a fair comparison between um, different approaches and for example for a new innovative approach that you look uh, to what level should we scale up to be as competitive with the business as usual scenario and based on this analysis define what's the funding gap and then to look how this funding gap to arrive to this uh, uh, wanted scaling uh, can be uh, 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 filled by public and private funding and also referring to the EU taxonomy uh, legislation at European level where they then go into identify different sustainable projects so this is for me something that's really essential. What we see very often is that, um, yeah, we, we, we compare, uh, like you, maybe Wendy can um, uh, adapt. The, the Dutch phrase is we adapt uh, apples with pears, I think. The, yeah, yeah. And we yes. should arrive to comparing apples with apples. Indeed. To show that we have a, a, a faster transition to the circular economy, as this is the ambition of the Green Deal. I think there's some real common sense, some real wisdom in that. Thank you. Some really good good responses. Thank you all. Now, we're at that point where I've been asking lots of questions. I just wonder whether, what do you personally think is that, what's the burning question that I should have asked? Not the questions that I've asked. It's the real burning question that I should have asked. And why don't we, Heather? What do you think? Or have we hit all the nails on the head and we're there? Or is there something really burning that you think? I wish you'd ask that. Yeah, well, it's a tough one. I think I think one question we often forget to ask, and uh, but you you were sort of hinting at it just now. Um, there's there's always a lot of emphasis on on um, making a business case for for adopting these technologies and the and the market for for recover products and those are those are very important things but but the financial return 
uh, from from the sale of products um, is only ever going to be one aspect of the of the value of of doing this. And I think part of the one of the questions that we often forget is what what is that whole picture of value uh, yeah. of of adopting these circular products? It's not always just going to be about um, the the financial gain from the recovered product. Although as as we know, they it is essential to make you know for that to make business sense at the end of the day. But but there is a wider value, and 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 we need to acknowledge that and 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 explore what that wider value is, and, and describe what it is as much as possible, even if we can't put a um, a financial figure to it, uh, and 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 communicate it as much as possible. Um, and so, yes, I, I feel it's a question that often gets left out. Thanks, and uh, you know, because people talk about carbon, they talk about social capital, they talk about natural capital, and I can't remember, but I think Coates was take, talking about four billion tons of cellulose. Somewhere that's coming out of the environment somewhere. So there's got to be a, this bigger picture on value. That's a great. That's a. I wish I'd asked that burning question. That's a great one. <laughs> Uh, what about you, Derek? What do you what do you think is the burning question we're, we're not asking or we missed well, off the page? When uh, uh, hearing the the input that was given by Kos and also Dieter, and Kos mentioned mutual understanding, and Dieter was mentioning all the different legislative proposals that are being uh, set up, and so uh, really and coming to this, uh, how we're going to come to this mutual understanding and have knowledge for the systemic impact of different decisions and we see now for example as uh, did refer to the phosphorus recovery there's a lot of emphasis on phosphorus recovery this will have a huge impact on the, the types of technologies that will be deployed on recovering phosphorus from sludge they are looking very much to incineration but how are we going to assure that all the other values that are in sludge are not being evaporated in a literal, literal sense and so you see different um, initiatives being taken but there are a lot of cause and effect relations uh, when we decide in one legislation we're going to focus on phosphorus that will have an impact on the other thing. The other uh, legislation was the Urban Waste for Treatment Directive where they focus more and more on recovering microplastics and pharmaceuticals etc. But sewage sludge is then the sink and then will have an impact on the quality of your product. So we have to think also on, and avoiding pollution at source. So all these things are interlinked so the uh, so the systemic check of your legislation is something that will be uh, very important if you want to realize the a, sustain, a sustainable society, as Heather said, maybe not in 2050, but uh, make the necessary steps towards it. So really understanding, have a mutual understanding of the different cause effects uh, that are happening. How can we uh, take steps there? That would be for me a, a burning question, yet unanswered. Thanks. Uh, that's, a, it's a, that's a great question, and uh, in many ways, I wish I'd asked it. But uh, uh, Eva, what about from your perspective? What, do you think, what, what, what haven't we said so far? Yes. Well, uh, the burning questions is always not only one question. We have a several questions that are burning because the time yeah. is already very far. Uh, that we don't have time to lose the time what we still have to save our planet. So, uh, in my opinion, the most important question what we have to ask ourselves, what we already have done as a normal citizen to make our life sustainable. And then we can ask industry and policymaker what they have done. So the, in the first step, I will look at myself, what I can do to make the life sustainable, and then support it also the policymaker and industry. And industry showed that I'm really interested in the sustainable products and the products which uh, are long life. So perhaps it will be this is not easy to put uh, one uh, burning question because we have too many questions we are at the moment very burning. Why it's, 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 we need so, so long time to introduce itself? Why we need uh, so many policymakers which are not even in the position 
to implement it, this, the, the rules. So I am very happy that at the moment in Germany there is already the legislation regarding the recovering for phosphorus, but still we have the, um, um, the transition period to 2029 and 2020 uh, and 2032. So why uh, always as to we ha have to ask why we need such long transition period if we exactly know that the climate change is already in place. Yeah, I don't know why we do, but we seem to. Things seem to be sharpening up a little bit, and we'll see what happens at the COP from a climate crisis perspective. But we have a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis, and we're trying to embrace circular economy. There's so many things, but making it personal is really important. I, I'd agree. Adita, have you, what's your perspective? You're in, in, in walking the corridors of power in Brussels. What do you think is the building question that we? I should have asked. That you think yeah. that's, that's the one I need. I can take it up there and I can change the world. Yeah, I think had I touched upon the market, and I think this is really a thing where more answers are needed. Um, and this is also a thing where the European Commission is, I think, struggling with um, in the in their EU circular economy action plan. They already announced that, and they agreed that uh, new more action is needed to create a market for secondary raw materials. But until now, I have not seen uh, what the Commission is intending to do to create this market. And uh, I talked already a lot about the end of waste criteria. Fine, but uh, what are the other uh, possibilities to create this market. And I represent the water authorities and the water authorities are not private companies. We are public authorities, but basically uh, if we cannot get any money for the for the services we provide, uh, yeah, then it will be quite difficult. So um, also from our perspective, it's interesting to find out what we can do on the national and the European level to create this market and what kind of legislation or funding programs could incentivize or create the right market condition. Yeah, interesting within the within the WOW uh, program, you've got partners like Seven Trent in the UK who are a private company. And it's sharing as much what they're, you know, what you each are doing. And that's what the whole principle of what we're trying to do in WOW, I think. But you've hit on something really important there. I wonder, Robert, what, what do you think? What do you think is the burning question that, you know, you brought well, well, I, I, to I, us? <laughs> my, my question is also, how can we uh, manage this uh, systemic change in, uh, not only in Europe, but, but I, I think it's a worldwide problem. And uh, the major question I have is, how can we manage to, to have, um, to, to make the secondary materials uh, more uh, attractive, not only in uh, the perception, but also finally uh, economies uh, driven by prices. So um, what, uh, how can we manage uh, that um, virgin material is not uh, uh, cheaper than uh, or less expensive than, than, than uh, or the secondary material? And that is what we see to, today is that uh, virgin material is, uh, more interesting than, than secondary material, and uh, that's it's, uh, hindering all uh, all market with this material. I think it's a, that's a really good point. And you know, when we talk about priming the pump and economies of scale, if we had if we had you know billions of tons going through something that's produced in cellular, how would that change the the whole economics of the whole system? I think that's really helpful. I just, I just wondered whether, you know, if you had a magic wand, each of you, and you could do one thing to help this, what would you do? What would, what is the one thing that you think? Right, my, my wish, my magic wand. The one thing that I would do is this. And to start this, Coos, are you on this call? I would suggest. Well, let's ask Coos. Yes, I am. Right, so if you had a magic wand, Coos, we're going to extend the, you, we're going to bring you on the panel a second as a practitioner. If you had that magic wand, concisely, what would that one thing be for you? And everyone else will just be thinking about theirs, but I think you'll probably see barriers and blockers. 
what would it be? Well, basically, I would prefer to do uh, two things, but but uh, I think that in a different way we have to stimulate uh, use uh, reuse of recovered materials, and uh, because uh, we can put everything in legislation, but you have to c overcome the situation where uh, you are early stage valued on a business case that is not really competitive with existing technology. So, uh, if I would make a choice, then if you would make for a user of recovered products uh it's very interesting to use them or, or so stimulate them you get a kind of a market pool and then we have to deal with it we have to supply it so yes, i think yes. that would that would be maybe the first stage to go through the market pool i think that's a good one and whilst you were saying that I, it was reminding me of the man who got two wishes from his fairy godmother and he said what would you like with the first wish and he and he was thinking, he loved to go to Ireland and on holiday. So he said, I'd like a pint of Guinness, but when I drink it, it replenishes itself. This is almost a circular economy story. And he, he got his Guinness and he drank it. And he said, what would you like with your second wish? He said, I'll have another one. <laughs> anyway, next, um, as I'm gonna, I'm, do you want me to pick you at random or would your hands like to shoot up on who would like to tell us what they would do with their magic wand? I'm looking for a hand off the panel. Dirk, that's very brave. What, what would your yeah. magic wish be? I'm, I mostly work in the in the water fields, and I find it actually very um, nice to see that uh, in the banks you already have water funds where you have companies that you can invest in a, in a list of companies that invest in water. So I would my one wish would be that you have uh, that you can step to a bank and that there is a fund where you have a list of all companies that work on uh, recovering of cellulose, uh, polyhydroxyalkanates, biodiesel, etc. Brilliant. That you Brilliant. can mobilize our private funding for uh, these type of uh, valuable uh, enterprises. I'd agree because sometimes it's just, you just all the time you're translating into a simple language that they can then invest in. I think that's really good. Um, Heather. What would you what would your wish be? Well, I suppose it, it, it's a bit archaic, but in some ways uh, it'd be nice to just go back in time and to and change the wording of the urban wastewater treatment directive uh, when it was first written. Because obviously in 1991, no one knew yes. about this stuff and it was just uh, big sewage treatment plants and, and uh, disposal to the environment and nothing else. And there's like, you know, everybody knows there's the tiniest, tiniest mention of, of recycled water and nothing else. Um, I think if we could have put some, some proper wording at the time, um, then I think it, we would have a lot, we would be a lot further along uh, in terms of the recovery of resources. Uh, and again, a bit, a, a bit sort of legally technical, but if you could just make, make very clear that sewage and, and wastewater was not subject did not have to be subject to the waste framework directive <laughs> from, yes. from the beginning. I think we would have avoided avoided a lot of these issues with the end of waste criteria, um, uh, and would have it would have made so forced the creation of its own framework. We, we we almost need you know like you can Google and you put in a word in one language and it translates into another. We almost need like this Google Translate to translate some of our legislation into something that's a bit more simple, practical, and coherent. That, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a wish from me anyway. Um, Robert, what do you think? You've got a wish, Robert. Here you go. But you've got to use it in the context yeah. of what we're talking about. <laughs> the Maserati's gone. <laughs> Well, I, we were talk, talking about magic and, uh, and the wishes, and uh, maybe it's not very realistic, uh, but it's magic. So um, my, my wish is that uh, with this magic uh, wand, uh, we can change the mindset of everybody that he uh, really has in his head uh, circularity, and uh, this could change also industry, this could change uh, acceptance, this should, could change uh, politics, uh, so that everybody is thinking circularly. I, I like that. Very, very, having, having, um, having been converted myself, I think, when I first met Alan MacArthur, I, I think she's made great inroads in terms of getting the mindset there on circular and across so many things. Well, I think where we are, 
I think we're, we're one of those last last years we've really got in getting there and getting changed. So I like that one. And I think um, Ava, what would you? Hey, don't worry, Dita. I'm coming to you soon. I can I can see you've got your wish ready, but Ava. <laughs> I have a lot of issues and wishes, and not is only the apple. Um, what I wish that exactly this um, meeting, this uh, conference today, it will be happened in next 10 years, and we will say, okay, we have done it as this functioning. The all issue which we all discuss, the phosphorus is recovered from the wastewater. The lipids are recovered from wastewater and they have a market. And uh, with PHA, we, ha we have recovered and uh, have a market. All these issues have implemented in the reality. Uh, re reality. So um, it will be simply real, real realized. <laughs> so what we need, Ava, we need a lasso and we throw the lasso on the graph, on the Mentimeter graph that said it would be 2050. And then we all pull together and we shift on across into 2030. Oh, that's, a, that's great. That's, a, that's really nice of you to use your wish in that way. Thank you. And Dita, what about your wish? Yeah, my wish or dream would be that all wastewater treatment plants in Europe become resource factories and are fully circular and supported at the same time by a coherent European and national framework, legal framework. I think that's brilliant. And I think I've seen some of that thinking in different water companies even using that language, which I think is really encouraging. So, um, so uh, that uh, concludes our questions and it leaves it, it, it's uh, incumbent on me to sort of just give you a few conclusions at the end but first of all um i just want to give all my thanks to all the presenters and the panel and the the project team at wow because a lot of preparation and effort's gone into this for us to bring it together in such a coherent and what i think has been a fantastic uh, exploration of all the facets of what we're about. I think it's been a great debate and I really appreciate everyone's personal and professional perspectives. I'd also really like to thank everyone for engaging through Mentimeter. And I think we couldn't probably have envisaged doing this 18 months ago, and yet we've done it so seamlessly and we've embraced the technology and everyone's been involved. That ability to reach out into the virtual world and engage people on this issue, these issues is really important. And it's really important when we think about how we are going to, you know, grasp those, change those hearts and minds around this subject. To reflect on today's discussion, I just ask that the WOW project team and our speakers today, they just think about the following. They don't, I don't want the answers. Just think. Has your call for action been heard? And in, in many ways, what you thought before you joined this debate, has it been changed, if only in a slight way, in terms of changing your perspective or given us something to build on to help on our momentum? What did the World Project team think they're going to do with the outcome of this debate? Really good one to reflect on. And, maybe at our next our next meeting to just come back with how we're going to use this but i think there's an awful lot of ideas and comments and suggestions coming to this it's all been videoed so i think we can look at it analyze it and see what makes sense but what will the wow team do when the big dream is reality when the 2050 is 2030 just think about what it'll look like uh, what it will feel like. I've been writing down a few words as we've gone through. I quite like just reflecting on clarify, simplify, you know, it's got to be safe. How we're going to scale up. How we're going to really, I think, dream big. 
without legal barriers. Imagine if legislation was an enabler. What a fantastic world that would be. The creating a level playing field is really important if we're going to get the market to work in this. I'd love to see that list of products that have been generated through our activities. Those are products that are mainstream products that are used and mainstream applications. But we do come back to it, and that is where are the funding gaps? How can we get the prime funding? And ultimately, how are we going to ma manage and um, reflect on the value of all our endeavours, looking at the total value of everything? I can't help thinking that governance is a bit like the oil that we need to unlock sometimes, to unlock an engine to get the cogs starting to move together. And I think there's some work in simplifying around that. Um, I'd like to send many thanks to you all for joining, but remember, the future's in our hands. Circular thinking's got an essential role to play if we're going to lead this planet to future generations in a better state than when we were born into it. We're seeing how the world is changing around a climate crisis, waking up to a biodiversity crisis, how carbon is even entering the vernacular, the way we talk about things. And I think that the things we've discussed will be mainstream, hopefully, sooner than we all think. So that brings to a close um, what today's session, but we've just got a few minutes left. So I just wondered whether, from a practitioner perspective and from an organisational perspective, Wendy, I yes. just wonder whether you could give me what, what, what springs to mind as you come to the end of this, and Coops, if you're ready, what springs to mind to you? Because you're, in many ways, not our guinea pig, but you're out there, you're out there really accelerating practical application of this. So Wendy first, has it met your expectations? No, uh, we, are, we are at the end of this uh, meeting, but uh, I hope this is the beginning that we can uh, really make a change. Uh, we have a lot of input uh, from, from all of you from the debate and we can go further with it. Uh, uh, we are also involved in uh, European um, legislation with several European associations. Uh, and as, as uh, my uh, part of that, I will also take care that we can have a circular approach uh, on that level. And also on the national level, we should do, uh, we should go further. So uh, we can do it, we just have to do it. And what, and Chris, can you come back on? If you're still there, sure, I, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that 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 you know, if you have to overcome hurdles, it it first starts with mutual understanding and talking with each other. So, uh, whatever the outcome is of of this debate, it brings parties closer to each other and it helps them to understand perspective from the other side. So, with that, it fulfilled my my uh, expectations and and I'm happy that we have these kind of panel debates and also uh, people that join and, and listen with us and, and, and go forward with that. And it also makes me a little bit more optimistic than uh, already than I was because I'm an optimistic man. But knowing that we are in 2050 uh, circular and that you can do about 80% of the work in 20% of the time, then at least within the next 10 years, we do 80% of, of our job. So yes, I'm happy with it. So Yapa at the start, he talked about how we were looking to embrace in terms of national action plans, what we're trying to do through WOW, which I think is really valuable. But I just wonder if, Kappa, if Yapa and Katrin, to close out as you opened up the discussion earlier, what are your reflections on, on what we've done today? Uh, Katrin first. Thank you, Mark. I was just uh, wanting to say, sometimes maybe you should invite yourself if you were not invited to say something, but you just invited me. Um, so uh, many thanks uh, for this uh, very good uh, debate and um, well uh, I'm really happy with the, the, the input that you gave us and uh, well we are uh, in WOW projects we are uh, um, uh, we want, do want some action so I would definitely uh, go back to our project team and uh, see how we can put your uh, um, well your your 
magic uh, uh, wishes into uh, concrete actions. So we will definitely, well, we, we have three demos already in our uh, uh, project showing that it's feasible to recover uh, valuable resources from sewage. We also uh, know that there are a lot of funding uh, possibilities uh, and my magic wand really wants to turn every skeptic person into a, a yes saying person. So uh, instead of that, I go to a, an authority and ask, well, what do you think? And uh, immediately they get an answer. It should be safe. It's, it should be uh, um, uh, cheap. Uh, uh, just start with saying, yes, this is a good idea. It's good to become circular. And yes, definitely we have to look at sewage treatment as well. That was really my, my biggest wish. Uh, and uh, well, I have a big smile after this uh, panel debate. Uh, so yes. many thanks. Um, one line from you, Yappa, in summary. How's it been? <laughs> it's even more difficult to ask me one line. Uh, but I, first of all, I completely agree with uh, Katrin just, uh, just said. And uh, I also already typed in the chat, but didn't send it yet. Thanks to you all, because I think you gave very valuable input, which we can use for to uh, further detail our action uh, calls for action in our European roadmap. But the, the, the thing I, I wrote down in big letters, uh, and I can't remember who said it because I forgot to put the name there, engage society. And when uh, society is engaged, then also the policy makers will follow. Uh, so I think that's something we uh, definitely have to discuss within our project team. How can we make sure that happens? Although I already see a lot of this happening and it's becoming more and more talked about and written about, but how can we even do that more? So that was my uh, big uh, learning thing for today. So to close, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go far, go together. But if you want to go fast, go alone. And I think we have to do both of those if we're gonna get there by 2030. Thanks everyone for participating. It's been great fun and really appreciate it. I think we're Thank there. Thank you very much, Mark. It, it, I think we say it's a wrap. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very all. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.